Thanks. All right. Our last panel of the day, last but not least, definitely not least, are the public defenders or public or defense counsel. Um, and um, again, we're opening up um, to this panel um, question about how these reforms are working um, in general and ways that we might be able to proceed, um, improve them both procedurally and substantively. Um, as with the panel of prosecutors, each member will dis each member of this panel will address different aspects of the law that we've covered today. And we have with us um, Jennifer Hansen from De Deputy Public Defender's Office from the State Public Defender. Hi. Uh, Andrew Gutierrez, Supervising Deputy District Attorney from the Public Defender in Santa Clara County. Um, I do not. Oh, see, hi, hi, Andrew. Um, Matthew Wechter, a supervising attorney from the San Diego Public Defender's Office, and Greg Fidel, a policy director from Initiate Justice. Again, if you would keep your comments to five minutes, I think we get most done during the Q&A process. I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Um, so, Ms. Hansen, can you go first? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, to, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hansen. I'm a deputy state public defender in the office of the state public defender. I'm in the indigent defense improvement division. Several years ago, OSPD's mandate was expanded beyond the death penalty to include working on supporting and expanding the quality of indigent defense across the state. Many people don't realize that 25 counties in California don't have public defender offices. We work on building capacity in those counties and also expanding the training across the state. I'm very grateful to be here today to provide testimony on a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is updates on recent law changes. I've got two specific recommendations based on what I've seen from my bird's eye view at OSPD. I personally was lucky to hear about felony murder reform back in 2018 when SB 1437 was being drafted by Senator Skinner's office. I had several clients convicted under the old definition of felony murder, including one who was a 19 year old who provided a phone number to set up a marijuana robbery that went badly and the drug dealer was killed. My client wasn't present for the robbery, but nevertheless was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. So as soon as the law went into effect in 2019, I filed a petition in his case and other cases, and I started working with the other people who drafted the bill to do trainings for attorneys across the state. We started a listserv for trial attorneys dealing with all of these new post-conviction sentencing laws. And our listserv now includes over 900 defense attorneys from across the state. Everybody's trying to keep up with the new laws. And it's great because through the listserv, we hear about the wins. And in the materials I provided, um, I highlighted that we have CDCR statistics that nearly 500 people were resentenced with murder or sentencing reform so far. But having the listserv, also gives us a finger on the pulse of the problems and the recurring roadblocks that are occurring with the implementation of the resentencing laws. For example, we heard back in 2018 and 2019 about when CDCR started sending the 1172.1 letters, which were then 1170B letters to hundreds of judges across the state, which gave them legal authority to recall old sentences for resentencing under the new laws. But judges didn't automatically appoint counsel and they didn't automatically set hearings and many cases were denied and no hearings were had and many letters were just never acted upon. So from that example and those reports from the trenches that's really led me to my first, the first of the two recommendations. Firstly, it's critically important that any future resentencing vehicle has got to include effective mechanisms for appointment of counsel. Um, today by the statute, resentencing hearings are often you know, complicated mixtures of legal arguments, and it's often required that the judges consider the, whether the person is a current public safety risk, and judges have to review the fee files that we've been talking about, records of post-conviction behavior, they have to assess the impact of childhood trauma. It's just really not realistic that incarcerated people can gather all the necessary records and reports and advocate for themselves in courtrooms very far from where they're being housed. As in the letter, as in the example with the CDCR letters, without attorneys, a lot of times cases just fall through the cracks and there's no way to ensure any kind of due process if you can't even get your case on calendar to serve in front of a judge. As Senator Skinner knows, appointment of counsel was very critical to the success of 1437. Um, the second recommendation um, that's bubbled up from my experience with the listserv 
um, uh, comes from, you know, things like currently there are really lengthy delays in resolving a lot of the murder resentencing hearings. I know that some of the, the DA talked about the high workload in the 1437 units. A lot of this is because, is because um, access to records. It's taking six months or even a year sometimes to get old trial transcripts. At these 1437 hearings, judges are having to decide if someone's still guilty of murder under current law. And so the records and the transcripts are critical. In the resentencing laws so far, it doesn't seem like anybody's thought through how to fairly and efficiently make these historical records available to all parties in advance. Another thing that we hear about is that attorneys will reach out to us at OSPD saying, my client just got resentenced to five years and he has credit for 20, but it's been three weeks and he hasn't been released. So what do I do? And this isn't an area, historically trial attorneys didn't have to deal with CDCR. So investigating this issue here at OSPD, we've been finding that there's not always clear communication between clerks in the courtroom and CDCR about what information needs to be included on sentencing orders and where courtroom clerks are supposed to be sending updated documents, which results in delayed releases for clients over serving. Those few things create my, our second, my second and final recommendation is the creation of some sort of a, a penal code implementation committee. And we really want there to be people that are on the ground that are working on these issues, public defenders, DAs, supervising criminal judges from big counties and from small counties, because also importantly, there has to be people from CDCR. We have to have people who are going to take a look at the law outside the political lens. Like we're not worried about the text of the statute at this point. We have to be having people in the same room who are going to say, look, this law is going into effect January 1. How can we make this effective across the state? What resources are available? And what are organizational recommendations that can be implemented across the county? If it's left to the county by county model, we're going to have justice by geography. Right. Clients in more resource counties are getting better results than clients in the smaller counties. And my last thing is that I want to say that I think that hopefully before the statute goes into effect, maybe that's a sweet spot and it will be an opportunity for people to work together before parties go into their respective corners. So I hope that something solution space can come out of this committee. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And I do want to, I'm not, we're going to come back to you. I didn't mean to cut you off, but it's just I want to try to keep us on time. Mr. Gutierrez, it's good to see you again, too. Thank you, um, Andy Gutierrez. I'm the supervisor of the Post-Conviction and Community Outreach Unit at Santa Clara County. Um, I've been asked to address some of the impact of, of recent sentencing and resentencing reform. Specifically, I wanted to comment on SB 81, uh, Judicial Discretion to Strike Enhancements. SB 483, uh, recall where there's an invalid one or three year prior conviction. Um, AB 1540, which is our general recall statute, and also SB 567, that's the permanent prior sentencing, um, where there are three terms available. That's a lot of information, but you have my written material. Um, what I do want to say in my oral comments is how impactful these changes have been. I have been doing this work for 25 years, and recall statutes were never used. As we went into just prior to the pandemic, they started to trickle in, but the, the obstacles were, were huge. You couldn't get a foot in the council, right? You couldn't get a court date. And now we're getting all these recalls back on reversal from appeal. And fortunately, we have now these statutes that give us a tool where judges can exercise discretion appropriately. What I can tell you now, in light of these reforms, particularly SB 81 and 1540 and SB 43, we are seeing judges with these cases coming back to them having to constrain their discretion, strike gun use, strike the nickel priors, and also strike priors in some cases. In just 2022, for my office, we have three defender officers, indigent, in my office, 66 years of, uh, we call full years saved from incarceration, just through CDCR initiated recall, 66 years. I think the strong language um, express and express legislative intent helps a lot. When I'm in court arguing these, we, the judges go back when the legislature makes their findings and their intent expressed, that is huge for us because sometimes the language in the statute just doesn't clarify exactly what we need. I also 
want to point something out that's really important that we're dealing with in the criminal justice side. Because of these changes by the legislature across all these domains, we have to do, we're doing, undergoing a massive holistic shift in the defense community. We're placing much greater emphasis on a clinical lens in terms of how we see our clients. And that's because of the mitigating circumstances that we have to now address at a very early stage, pre-conviction and post-conviction, which goes back to when someone was born. Um, we have to consider public safety. Public safety is embedded in a lot of the statutes. So we have to address that. And that's why we have to intentionally engage our clients early in the process and their families and their community and understand reentry and understand how to work with CDCR and parole. So that's what I mean by applying a clinical lens. So that required a dramatic shift in our focus as defense advocates. My recommendations are spelled out. The number one thing is I think we have to clarify that the term enhancement under SB81 applies to strike prior. I have a client pending sentencing, he's been in since 1999, 1998 on simple possession of cocaine on a three strike case, maybe one of the few in the state. I anticipate they're gonna argue that I cannot use SB 81 because it doesn't apply to three strike cases. I hope that doesn't happen, but we need clarification on that. Um, another recommendation is to clarify that courts have to consider the mitigating circumstances listed under SB 81 and they can't get out of that by saying, oh, we did the public safety determination first. Therefore, we don't have to consider all these mitigators. The mitigators totally, in some respects, overlap with the public safety determination. But we have some case law that states uh, provide a pathway for courts to avoid considering the mitigators. I think we need to clarify what great weight means under SB 81. I have my written comments with some suggestions. And finally, um, with regard to aggravating factors to impose the high term, next Friday, a judicial council will vote on recommendation for adopting some culture instructions on that. However, we also have a case pending in the Supreme Court on that issue. What I encourage the legislature to do is to take this information, but consider codified and having legislature take the role of setting punishment, especially where a jury has to make factual findings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. It's good to see you again. Um, Mr. Wechter. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the committee's uh, allowance for me to testify today. Um, I will try to keep my comments short as my memo is actually fairly lengthy. <laughs> um, I will note that you know we've had a lot of good that has come from these resentencings, uh, but there's also been some misunderstandings and some bumps along the road. Uh, I hope that my recommendations today will provide some insight as to what has happened on the ground. The first one is really access to CDCR. I was listening to some of the other panelists. Um, and it really is not just records, but it's access to the clients. Um, luckily, in post, we always say never let a good pandemic go to waste. Uh, one of the things that we had now is we do have increased access uh, to video in some institutions. And uh, the problem is that it's not institution wide or it's not statewide. And so we have very, um, difficult times getting in touch with these clients to actually have reasonable conversations uh, when we're trying to get them on the phone and try to get them um, in person. Uh, litigation coordinators, as I indicated in my memo, are horribly burdened uh, in a situation where they were not in years past. Um, and I do feel for them when I talk to them, but at the other end of it, my client is more important um, and we need to be able to get to our clients and, and have those discussions. Um, my recommendations with regards to uh, access to clients and access to records really boil down to making sure that those C file delays that we've been hearing about um, are ways that we can deal with that. Um, there are some DA's offices uh, that are able to get access to electronic copies of those records with that um, release of information from us much more quickly. When the defense has to go get it, we have to have send those requests to the litigation coordinator, and it sometimes will take weeks to months for us to get that. And then we have to pay for it by check. And then it comes to us on a CD instead of coming through. I, you know, I, I could go then, on. I, I feel your pain. Yes, <laughs> I will keep those comments short. But really, I do think finding a way to have those using the tools that we have in this modern technological society to make those portals available 
so we can have confidential communications more readily would be a great benefit to whatever sentencing reforms the uh, this committee or the legislature brings forward. Um, class clarification regarding eligibility, you know, with the specificity, I specifically worked on 483 as well as AB 1950. I'm kind of the legislative person for my office when new things come down. Um, you know, I do think the legislature deserves credit for the specificity that they gave at, with this committee's recommendation on ways to drill down on who is eligible. Um, but the problem is in that specificity, now some judges and prosecutors' offices use that as a way to make it so that that is the only method. Um, and that's kind of going through the courts right now about whether the list from CDCR is the exclusive method for SB 483. So that is something that we need to both weigh when we uh, put those that language together and then whether someone that is eligible if they're on parole or PRCS, because they're still under the threat of going back to prison as a result of that. So I think that, you know, specificity there. And then lastly, in my initial comments, the clarification for handling and, and calendaring. We heard a lot about that from some of the prior uh, people. I won't um, continue that process only to say that I think the centralized process as much as possible within counties is incredibly important. Um, it would eliminate disparate rulings between judges, especially in large counties like Los Angeles. Um, one, a lot of the things that I talked about in my memo and that I hope to answer in Q&A today, we addressed head on in San Diego County. Um, the judge, the superior court clerks and operations folks and our district attorney have been very cooperative on the logistics of getting these things through. Not to say we don't fight about it once we get to court, but at least we've agreed um, and have cooperated on how to get there. I do think the abstract of judgment um, getting to CDCR quickly, if there is a contemplation that is a CTS, I'm sure that is without uh, objection here. Um, and really, I think the, the requirement to meet and confer, it sounds like that is something that goes on in Santa Clara, and I'm sure Mr. Gutierrez can speak more to that. But uh, we do that as, uh, as well, too. The majority of our SB 483 resentencings and a lot of our uh, uh, DA initiated resentencings are all negotiated ahead of time. Um, and a lot, lot happens on the 1437s as well. So I share my uh, comments from Ms. Hansen that I do hope that there's some logistics that we can provide to uh, help the committee make recommendations to the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Mr. Fidel, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, chair and members. My name is Gregory Fidel. I'm the Policy Director for Initiate Justice. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today. I'm going to speak very briefly on the effect of these recent reforms on folks who are inside, folks who are currently incarcerated, and hope to shine a light on some of the gaps in terms of information and understanding for eligibility, uh, again, of these reforms. So part of my work with Initiate Justice is to visit prisons throughout California. Um, COVID has impacted this, of course, but we visit different prisons and we host uh, workshops that really focus on political education and civic engagement uh, for a few reasons. Uh, primarily, there are a lot of studies out there that show that civic engagement is really tied uh, to public safety. So folks who care about their community, folks who feel valued by their community uh, are a lot less likely to then harm their community. And then the inverse of that is folks who are disconnected, uh, isolated, ostracized from their community, uh, then go on to and sometimes harm their community. So what we're trying to do is to build that bridge to the folks who are currently incarcerated, know what's going on out here, how they can use their voice, how they can be active in the legislative process, and how they can carry that with them uh, when they return to the community. So the overwhelming impact of these recent reforms, in my opinion, has been hope. I think a secondary impact, uh, very much related, is a very strong interest in the legislature in following bills, uh, and again, in, in using their voice to support these measures as they advance uh, in Sacramento. I think in the past, we may have visited a specific yard and we would see that, you know, maybe three or four folks, what you would consider legal beagles. So these would be the guys on the yard who study emerging case law, they study statute, they read the constitution, they then provide guidance and information to the rest of the facility. Whereas I think now we visit these facilities and we'll go in an auditorium, or a gymnasium or law library, and you'll have 30, 40 participants who they know their stuff, man. They're on top of it. They're sharp as a whip. Uh, and that's just been my own anecdotal experience. But I think it really speaks to a larger trend uh, with folks, again, who they have more hope, 
They have more interest. They're following these things. They know when a bill gets amended. They know what's happening. Uh, I've heard that these guys just live in the law library. They are on LexisNexis. They're following these updates as best they can. Um, but of course, there are information gaps that exist because these folks are incarcerated. Um, with Initiate Justice, we have a quarterly journal that we send to 45,000 currently incarcerated people in California. So essentially half of the prison population. This is an advocacy and education uh, journal where we talk about updates to the legislation that Initiate Justice is sponsoring. Uh, we send a fuller list of uh, meaningful criminal justice reform that's moving forward in California. Uh, and then we ask folks to participate by sending in letters of support and otherwise submitting their feedback and input about the bills. Uh, despite that newsletter that reaches a lot of folks, I think what we've seen is that a lot of folks know about pending legislation, so they'll know the bill number, so they'll know SB 81, but they won't know there is a variance in the understanding exactly of what SB 81 does. So the reason I'm highlighting that bill is that I think pretty immediately once it was introduced, it got a lot of traffic inside, the rumor mill really picked up. Um, and the biggest misunderstanding was whether or not it's retroactive, right? And that is the number one question we get when we do these workshops, when we receive mail, when we get phone calls. Of course. Essentially, does this impact me, impact me right now? Yeah. Um, I think a, a related question has been about the Racial Justice Act. Um, I'm not an attorney, but upon these visits, I am very frequently asked, um, do I have an RJA case? Is this a good thing to file on? How do I get the data and stats I need to then prove these disparities? Uh, in my county. And so questions related to access of this legal information and data uh, is, is difficult, obviously, for the folks in prison to receive. So I will very briefly wrap up and say one more thing that related to this gap in information and understanding is the nuances of the legislative process, how folks can understand. Uh, I think the if the governor signs or vetoes, that's a very simple binary understanding that folks can get on board with, but how the bills die, in committee and appropriations elsewhere, leads to a lot of confusion that is hard for uh, the folks inside to follow and to know what that means for them, what are the stakes here. So we try our best to close the, those gaps and really bring people up to speed so they can know about these bills and how they are affecting their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. You guys are the last panel and it's been a long day. Thank you to my fellow commission committee members. Uh, Mr. Fidel, I hope that if the one thing that you learned today is that there's a lot of confusion amongst the, about these laws amongst experts who practice this every day. So at least please tell folks inside that they are not alone and um, on that score. And that doesn't mean that there can't be better communication and more clarity. I'm not saying that, but I just want to hope that that. Um, Judge Spinoza or Senator Skinner, do you have any comments or questions? Not really. I found the, the um, descriptions fascinating. I. Um, it's interesting, I had been, I went before uh, meeting with judicial counsel once, just interaction with, and they did talk a lot about how they use the findings and the author's statement and such as they try to uh, apply some of these laws when there's a lack of clarity. And I think none of us intend for there to be a lack of clarity in the the writing of the statute, but I think it happens. Obviously, our penal code is so complicated, which is one of the jobs we've been giving, given to try to uh, reduce it. I don't know if if we have pulled that off, but uh, you know, we are we are partly trying to make it a little less complicated. But so I just appreciate hearing from everyone. Um. Yes, in our attempts to simplify things, we may have made, I think we've increased justice, hopefully, uh, hopefully, and um, perhaps also increased complications. But anyway, uh, Assembly Member uh, Brian, I see you there. No, I just want to thank all of the guests for the final panel, um, Greg, especially in that experience from folks who are inside. Um, I think one of the things we're learning today, Mr. Chair, is, is that we can pass good legislation that has an impact on you know, reducing the size of the criminal legal system in California, but we may have to legislate implementation as well uh, and be more clear about oh, the next for, step. For certain. And that's the reason why we're having this, uh, you know, as somebody who's worked on both sides of this and, you know, practices and courts, implementation is at least half the battle. And one of the things that as you were speaking and as you were speaking, Mr. Fidel, 
I was thinking, well, you know, maybe the legislature should, or we should require the legislature to provide some sort of summary for folks inside. But then I thought maybe we could just do that. Like, why do we need to pass legislation? Tom, I hate to put work on your desk, but anyway, that's something that we might uh, think about internally about doing to help provide some of the insights. Of course, the more as, you- As long as our summary is binding on the courts, I'm happy to summarize every bill. Yeah. I <laughs> Um, I do want to, so um, I'm going to take the liberty to ask a couple of, of questions here. Um, I thought, uh, as, as, as some of you know, I, um, you know, I, I litigate post-conviction cases on behalf of people in prison all the time. So I share a lot of your frustrations, pain, and I identify with them. Um, and I want to try to expedite the process. I thought the idea of the remote visits um, that seems would be super, super duper helpful. Um, one thing that I actually raised, and I was wondering if you could respond to, is do we think that, uh, what do you guys think about a statute that said CDCR would be required to give C files to prosecutors in contemplating prosecutorial initiated resentencing without, um, the uh, consent of, so they don't have to go through the, the release process that we all are dealing with. So in other words, sorry to be mealy mouth, DA requests C file as a law enforcement agency in contemplation for prosecutorial initiative resentencing and that CDCR be required to provide that without an inmate's uh, consent. I think that, um, I mean, it'd be more efficient. They can get it anyways. They do get it anyways. Whether it's yep. not one that they, they get it after a, a significant amount of bureaucracy, or or they have to subpoena it. The one thing I'd be concerned about is if that statute was written, it would have to be written in a way that it tightly controls how that C file can be used. So you can't have one prosecutor get it for PIR, prosecution initiated resentencing, and then somehow it's used for some other purpose. That oh, would be the concern. Anybody else? So, you, but you would be, would it be self sufficient for you if there were prescriptions in the statute that said it could only be used for PIR purposes? Having done PIR for quite a bit of time, um, they're getting information anyway. So, right. um, I personally don't have a problem with that. Um, other people might, but for PIR, if the prosecutor is going to get it anyways, I don't see if it's statute is crafted carefully. Um, I don't see that as a major problem. So uh, do other people have thoughts on that particular piece? I, I would only, I, I agree uh, with Andrew. I, I'd only add that sometimes there may be some uh, HIPAA protected information in there that if there isn't an actual subpoena or a judge's ruling or a waiver um, that that might cause. So that would have to be crafted a certain way, but I'm sure more educated folks than myself on HIPAA would uh, have some thoughts on that. Ms. Hansen? I would just want there to also be some sort of parallel, easier way for the defense attorneys to get the C file. I, I, was, I, was, I, was, was, ahead, I was, was ahead of you that they should then forward a copy on directly to the public defender's office. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm just trying to expedite the process. A lot of people are complaining about the process. We deal with a lot of waiver issues. I'm sure you do. It's, it's, it seems like an unnecessary step. I don't think that we've ever run into somebody who's not signed the waiver. Mr. Fidel, do you have any concern about this? No, but I would love to have a uh, meeting like this inside the prisons and ask the folks themselves. Um, we're, we're ahead of you on that too. We're thinking about that as well. All right. Um, for uh, Focusing on prosecutorial initiated resentencing for the time being, what is, would you guys say is the most significant sticking point in order to, we, you saw the data, I'm sure you're all aware, we're all extraordinarily frustrated about how few cases are being recommended. In your mind, how can we expedite the process the quickest? We struggle, it's not just staffing. Staffing is a problem, but I, I've been doing PIR, we have a grant. We have to do quantitative analysis of data. So, Public defender offices and DA offices aren't necessarily set up for that. So we have, for example, a county snapshot of a lot of data from every single person from Santa Clara County, tons of demographic information. We need C 
assistance in interpreting that data to develop cohorts. So we can, in an evidence-based way, so we need expertise, whether it's academic or something else, we need to be able to interpret the, the data. We can make evidence-based recommendations for cohorts. And that's where we're struggling. We would have- right, so just, just, uh, just to make sure I understand, I'm sorry to cut you off. And actually, I, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm working with the DA's office on their data, you know, in Santa Clara County. Um, so I, I'm, so in order to identify cohorts that you might then recommend to the district attorney or to the CDCR or whomever, um, that you want to be able to be able to crunch that data a little bit better, easier. Yeah, that's that's frankly, in my experience personally, that's a bit of challenge for us. Ms. Hansen or Mr. Wechter? My understanding, have... I would talk about the CBOs, the community-based organizations. Um, I believe in the RAND report that came out initially, none of the DA's offices had yet contracted with any CBOs. Um, in my experience, it's usually defense attorneys and the defense bar that's more connected with the CBOs. And so, and what do you mean by seat contract? You mean with the reentry programs? Yeah, there's a category in the PIR. There's money. He said it was no. I, I understand, but what, what? So, what would be most helpful? If it would be maybe the, the contract could be with the public defender's office instead of with the, through the DA, because right now the DA is the one who has to contract with the. And you think that that would unclog the log jam? I understand. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if they've made any connections yet, right? In the in the RAND study, none of the DAs had yet worked. With the CBO. Yeah, it was only the first six months. I do know that some of the contracts have been made. I don't, I don't know if that helps expedite cases or not, honestly. Um, well, the DA did talk about how part of the problem is that they have to get these reentry plans created. And with staffing issues, it's often the CBOs that are more connected with the transitional housing and that usually can get the people in reentry plans put together quicker. So there's nothing particular in this in the statute or the procedures that that is the biggest. That you that that you would you would identify as the biggest logjam. Well, I, I just I my understanding is that the CBO has to have the connection with the DA. So maybe make it more open-ended. It could be the CBO could work with the PD or with the DA. Got it. Got it. Mr. Wechter? I, I would echo what they both just said. I don't have anything to add other than that. I think the reentry planning has been a huge sticking point on actually moving it from that the slide from the prior RAND study from that. DA still considering or it's been submitted, but in which that number looked like it was the largest number of all. I think getting it outside of that middle ground or maybe putting some sort of time frame or reasonable time to consider, I think that might move things along more quickly. I, I will be in touch with both of you separately to make sure that that, that, pe that at least piece gets resolved. I think that that's solvable. Um, with regard to the RJA, um racial justice act do you believe that there is data sharing the first step that we should look at better data sharing between the department of justice and and public defender offices i mean yeah. go ahead assembly member brian i was gonna say assuming that i mean it, it might even need to be better data sharing from da's to the doj from the doj to the public defender's office, right? They're, they're getting a lot of, what's being reported or what we heard earlier is that in the aggregate, the data that's coming from DOJ suggests that it's usable, um, but it may not be micro enough. The, the DA's offices might be sending the DOJ data that's already aggregated in a way that um, folks are wishing it wouldn't be. I, I think that that's right. Um, I was wondering if if the public defenders, do you agree that the data sharing is the first and biggest step that needs to be addressed in order to impl better implementation of the RJA? 100%, yes. All right. I agree. Um, there was some discussion earlier about uh, universal resentencing, sending that back to giving that discretion to the judges. Do you, do you have concerns about um, Unintended consequences there, meaning prosecutors might stop, CDCR might stop. CDCR barely started. <laughs> mm. CDCR has sent more people back to court than anybody than any other than all the other DA offices combined. That's so, fair. That's fair. That makes me sad. Yeah, but by maybe tenfold. I I, I would say that I. I that is always a possibility, uh, but I think the the possible bet from my perspective, the possible benefits outweigh 
the reverse risks, um, so kind of almost similar to what Assemblymember Ryan was saying. I mean, I think that the more uh, we can get it into the hands of the of the judges, that even if it reduces a little bit on on CDCR or or DA, I think that might open the door to uh, more possibilities. I, I agree, and I think you know we kind of adopt a no wrong door approach because. You know, we're not going to just calendar people to come back to the judge without preparation, doing a full workup, very applied clinical lens. So it's not like the floodgates are going to be open. It's a very intentional process. So I don't think it'll be so. They don't work with CIR, they don't work with CCR recall. We'll try a judicial recall. So it's sort of a no wrong door. But to do that, we have to really clinically work the case up. No, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, all right. Um, Judge Espinoza, do you have any last question? No. Um, I guess I, I relate to a lot of the concerns that you guys raised. It's good to talk to you all, and I, I you know, and we'll continue to do so. Um, at the top of the the meeting today, I don't know if you saw or heard. We've we the state of California has we believe by our count resentenced um, eleven thousand people. Um, largely thanks to public defenders all throughout the state. And that's 11, That's an extraordinary number, and we should all be grateful and thank, thankful. I think we also have know that there's a lot more work to do. The federal system has resentenced far more than that. Um, and um, we're trying to find ways that not only uh, create new doors for resentencing, but the doors that we have tried to open to make sure that those are used as efficiently as possible. And that's been the main focus of today's um, hearing. As I say to everybody, no good deed goes unpunished. We'll be back in touch. I know several of you. It's good to meet the others. Thank you all very much. And uh, I, I have a good weekend. Thank you. And please don't hesitate to reach back out to us if there are things that we've missed. Oh, that's good. All right. Um, we're really running out of time. And um, uh, it's, you know, it's late on a Friday. So I want to summarize a couple of things. Assembly Member Brian and Judge Espinoza ask if you guys have anything, any other things that you want to add to your wish list, and then we'll send um, staff off to do further investigation and research. Um, we also have to do public comment. So I'm with and, that. Would you come? And, oh, I was going to say we also have Doug Bond for a oh update. shoot, Doug, I am so sorry. Um, we'll see there. It's he's yeah he he'll he's being promoted. All right. Let me try one more time. There we go. And ending on a on a happy note though, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so Doug, sorry, sorry to drop to cut you off there. Um let me just say again, ending in some ways where we started. We started the day by mentioning the Governor Newsom was at San Quentin to emphasize um, his re renewed commitment, I think, and continued commitment to rehabilitation and reentry. It is something that this committee has been involved with for, you know, since the outset. Um, last year, based on our proposal, the legislature committed or uh, offered $120 million to enhance reentry programs under what we sometimes call the MCRP or Men's Community Reentry Program. Uh, Doug Bond, who's the CEO of Amity Foundation, uh, runs many of those programs throughout the state. Um, and he was a witness back here in, in 2021 where we discussed the reentry program. Um, it allows people to serve the last portion of their sentence in a community-based traditional transitional housing program. And it has uh, been shown to reduce recidivism by people who complete it um, by an astonishing 90%. Um, in our 2021 report, we recommended that CDCR expend this program uh, to everybody leaving prison. And in an effort led by Senator Skinner, significant funding, as I had mentioned, was included in last year's budget. Uh, Mr. Bond will give us an update on steps that have been taken since the funding um, and was approved by the legislature and the governor. Doug, it's good to see you again and uh, take it away if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. I appreciate you allowing me to come here to speak and talk about the men's community reentry program expansion, the women's uh, community reentry program expansion. A few updates on that. Uh, Amity continues to be a champion in this space and very invested in the expansion of these programs. Uh, requests for information came out 
from CDCR on August 31st, 2022. Uh, they were due in October, early October. We submitted for a number of the counties that were uh, proposed and we did both renovation proposals of existing buildings and some design build proposals. Uh, the department came out and did site visits in October. There were some delays throughout the holidays, and then we've heard back recently in the first part of the year. Uh, we proposed eight different projects ranging from 80 to 120 beds in each one of the counties that were selected or uh, proposed. The department came back, uh, Department of Corrections came back and selected, I believe, three counties out of that. We didn't expect them to uh, approve every county submitted. Uh, I will say just to go through, so that's some of the highlights. Uh, very ex excited about this project and the expansion given the, su the success of the program. Uh, just to highlight a few of the challenges though, it's been about 10 months since, this, uh, since the budget was passed and these agreements are still not in place. Um, we're asking for this to be fast-tracked uh, because we have to go out, purchase buildings, or get folks to purchase buildings to lease, and that's been pretty time-consuming, and less nonprofits are um, get using existing space, frankly. It's really hard for us to find new locations that are not currently being used for this project as well and get everything in place to stand these up appropriately. Uh, we're still facing other challenges on some of the rate issues on the existing projects that are in place, which is really making an impact on the new beds um, going out. We're hoping to work with CDCR on that. And then really asking CDCR to streamline their authority to go into agreements uh, so we can quickly start these projects and move forward on the men's community rancher programs. There's a, that's a brief update. Uh, I know that we're short on time here and I wanted to provide a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much. And listen, I, I know that 10 months seems like a long period of time, but I'm impressed that both CDCR and you all have able to put out the request for proposals, put eight proposals together and have three proposed in, you know, I think a relatively short period of time, given how um, ambitious this plan is. Um, I understand that some of your concerns about streamlining are basically contracting issues within CDCR. Are there legislative fixes that you think that we can help recommend in order to further expedite and, um, the process? I think we're exploring some of the challenges with land use right now and by right use. I think that's probably our biggest hurdle. Um, outside of that, I, I believe it's simply just making sure that the funding remains in place for us to be able to execute these contracts and move forward. And it does seem like the this funding, at least from the, the it remains in the governor's budget, and I think remains a priority for everyone. It's something that we want to see continued expanding. And do you believe do you believe that it can continue to with appropriate funding that this could be um, ex continued to be expanded, or do you think we kind of reached the maximum amount of people that we can offer the service to the opportunity? With the appropriate funding, we can continue to expand this program successfully. Is there any reason why? Um, Everyone leaving CDCR shouldn't be given this as the as their exit point from incarceration. I believe that there is specialized programs set up for individuals' needs. You know that we really could tailor it um, for those returning home. I believe right now we're at 1,200 beds, and hopefully plan to expand that to a, a little over 2,000 beds and forward from there. Um, it really should be the way that people come home from incarceration, frankly, a safe, uh, supportive place uh, with supportive services. People are going to be coming home without those services. And so I really, truly believe that people should have that level of support of, upon their return. Assemblyman Breyer, do you have a question? All right. No, just wanted to, Doug, really appreciate all that you do and for sharing, um, sharing with us. I'm sorry that... Uh, the bureaucracy is moving slower than we need it to be after we've already approved certain things. So whatever I can do to be helpful. Thank you. I think we all stand by that. I was wondering um, if you had a response to another suggestion that we've been floating around is um, people who are eligible to go before um, BPH, lifers, um, something that we've discussed with um, others involved in the lifer process is um, instead of right now, for the most part, 
when you go before BPH, you're either denied, which you go back to prison, continue serving your life sentence, or you're released on the street and perhaps go to a, a stop bed. Um, could you imagine a middle ground where somebody is um, granted parole to an MCRP program, and then upon completion of the full MCRP program, that, that would qualify as a grant of parole. Would that seem to make sense to you? Or is that something that MCRP is not really set up to do? I think it would make perfect sense for us as one of the groups that many uh, rely on for those being resentenced coming home. We see that as a safe um, place for folks that are resentenced to come home to. So we would absolutely um, see that being able to fold into this program. And you provide housing for, so somebody comes to you straight from prison, they have no connection, no money, no nothing. Um, you provide housing for them for two years and then and then what happens? They're out on the street? No, we provide transition from there, either with rental assistance programs uh, into housing. We hope to expand on that. I think, you know, people leaving that program have to have safe housing uh, stable income and supportive services beyond that. So we provide comprehensive case management, uh, reinsure recovery housing from that point or rental assistance as well. So MCRP is the first step. And then we really want to make sure that beyond that, we're making a long-term investment. Usually a year beyond that, we're there to help support them. So you start planning for their house. They're with you for two years and you start planning for their, tra their transition out of MCRP into a different housing Months, I presume, before they're released. Yes, yeah. months before that, if people have to leave with safe housing and and supportive services and stable income. And while they're in MCRP, and I, is this? I don't know if this is mandatory for MCRP or um, something that that CDCR you have implemented. Are all people on electronic monitoring? Yes, all the uh, participants or students, as we refer to in the program, are on electronic monitoring uh, as part of that with CDCR. And but they're still able to go get jobs and see their families and leave campus. Care. Yes, absolutely. They're able to go in the community to work uh, in the community to use all the public services in the community and be part of the community um, with with that in place. And when they have a job, where does their, they don't, do they have their own money? How does that, where does their salary go? So we require 75% savings and everything is provided uh, for our participants in the program. And so that's been established for quite some time. We want people to leave with a significant savings over that two year period. And do you know what the average, do you know, can we estimate how much people have saved up? So they're not paying for rent and they're not paying for food for the most part, I assume when they're on their job or whatever, they get a snack or a lunch or whatever they pay for. But for the most part, they're saving their money. And do you know how much money we're saving people? I provide you that data for the committee, but I would say that I've seen people leave with tens of thousands of dollars and really head start. Um, Livable, I just ran into one of our union electricians returning back to the MCRP program on my way to the office right now. Um, to join you all, and he'll be making 80, 90 an hour on a prevailing wage union job um, working on the Baltimore Stadium right now. So the, a job that he got while he was in MCRP? Currently in MCRP. He's currently in MCRP. He's currently in MCRP, and he is working on prevailing wage um, as a prevailing wage electrician. I, I think that that's amazing, you know, because I think that, you know, we have a hard time imagining these people, these people are still serving their sentences. So they're still technically CDCR prisoners or under CDCR jurisdiction, but at the same time, they're actually really in reintegrating the community in a, in a, genu in a genuine way. And, um, you know, Doug, you and I have gone way back. Um, not only I, you've literally saved people's lives that, you know, that I know and have been there for people who are, you know, at the most in need and also lifting people up and the work that you guys do is really extraordinary. I just wanted to say that, you know, officially. Um, Judge Espinosa, do you have any questions? Well, I don't have any questions. I, I want to thank Doug for coming. Um, I too have worked with Doug previously in the Amity Foundation. And one of the things that we explored with the LA County Sheriff's Department a few years ago was the, the specter of folks who are serving long sentences in the LA County Jail as a result of realignment and the possibility of creating a similar exit strategy for that population. Um, to come out of the LA County Jail before their sentences are complete to receive the sorts of reentry services that Amity provides. Um, there was a lot of interest, but no um, 
money available to create such a program. ODR didn't have sufficient funding, nor did the Sheriff's Department, but I would love to see this committee. I don't, I don't know to what extent that problem exists statewide, um, but there are certainly people who could benefit from a similar program coming out of the LA County Jail. Yeah, Doug, I think that you, we've talked about this, yes? Yes, and if I can, and good to see Judge Espinosa. We're still having those conversations. We're actually meeting with county leadership, and I think Jay Cod um, is helping to lead that effort. We're talking about sentencing, rather than sentencing people to jail, um, having a community-based option for people um, with supportive services around them as well. And so those conversations are still happen happening, and we're looking at a 100-bed pilot program in L.A. County right now. Awesome. That's that's good to hear. Thank you. Assembly Member Brian. Any last words? No, no. Doug, I could tell them how close we are, <laughs> but it sounds like everybody also has done a lot of work with you and has a lot of love for you. You know, I think everybody wants to be best friends with Doug. I mean, my always my only concern is is I just I hate that the amazing work that you do goes so deeply directed through CDCR. And I wish we were building infrastructure the same way the county. Judge Espinoza and some others have found alternative sets of infrastructure to move those dollars through. I understand the relationship currently, but over the next you know decade or so, perhaps with this committee, um, but with you, I'd love to continue those conversations. Yes, thank you, Assemblymember Brian. Good to see you as well. Um, and I, I will say that the Division of Rehabilitative Programs has to be, we have to make that investment um, through those initiatives, just like we did with ODR. Uh, in LA as well, so couldn't agree more. All right. Well, thank you. I, we're going to um, we're going to continue to rely on your expertise, both on the policy level, but also kind of in executing and a lot of the uh, laws that we were talking about today. Um, just before you got on, I hope that you heard that you know the reentry services are you know top of mind for prosecutors, defense counsel, and judges. They really feel disconnected from your community, and it's something that um, we are work that it, you know I'm not laying blame at anybody's feet there, but it's something that we're looking working very hard to try to implement both on an agency wide level, but also by way of legislation. So thank you for being you know really the leader in that, and um, we continue to look forward to working with you. Thank you as well, and I appreciate the invitation to join today. All right. Um, I do want to move on. Um, as I said, it's getting uh, late this afternoon. Um, Judge Espinoza, I'm going to list a couple of ideas that came up. Obviously, we've lost some of our fellow committee members, and then I want, and we know we need to hear from uh, public comment. But these are the things that came up for me that we should consider, and I want to know if there's anything that you'd like to add to the list. Things that um, I hope that staff can look into for our next meeting as we continue to think about these ideas. Procedural rules for resentencing. We've talked about documents, appointment of counsel, calendaring, how those documents in order to better facilitate, especially the resentencing proceedings. We've talked, I think there was an allusion to uh, retroactivity of the nickel priors. That seems to be one of the most effective reforms that um, has gone through. And can we make that retroactive? Uh, Judge Lowenthal um, brought up universal second look sentencing, perhaps, or ways the judges can look back at uh, sentencing, perhaps after some period of time. We've talked about data, better data sharing and data collection for the Racial Justice Act um, and codifying that SB 81 applies to strikes. Those are the notes that I took. Uh, I don't know, Judge Espinoza, if you have others that you want to have on the list or Tom, if there's anything that I should also raise. Judge? So the only other thing that that came up on from a couple of the presenters um, that we only did a light touch on. And that is this idea of having a centralized court, particularly in the large urban counties. Yes. To hear these cases. I know that it, based on my experience in Los Angeles and you appeared before me in a centralized court where we were looking at resentencing um, third strikers. Um, and we also centralized the habeas petition process um, for lifers coming, uh, you know, either who had been denied parole by the parole board or have their grants of parole reversed by the governor. Those, those types of approaches really uh, produce consistent outcomes um, and efficiencies that, that can't be, can't be um, had when you're just going from courtroom to courtroom. 
uh, trying to find someone to hear your case. So I, I don't know how that fits into this conversation, but I think it needs to be in the back of our mind that that, that is the preferred system. Um, I definitely think it's part of the procedure. I will just tell you between us and everybody listening, mm -hmm. um, I've had mixed experiences with centralized courtroom for Proposition 36. That was all centered with one judge who his rulings were incredibly detailed. He was very familiar with the law and consistent. At the same time, 10 years later, we're still litigating some of those cases. Now, that's not all his fault, but that's what happens when you centralize um, in one court. Sure. Um, so I would I think that there's some data that we can look at as to whether or not. Um, I think that there's argument that judges who are familiar with cases may want to see them. And we've had both positive and negative experiences with judges who I remember this case. And mm -hmm. I'm glad to have the opportunity to revisit it. So um, I have mixed feelings about it. I totally understand. And I believe absolutely the consistency and expertise and not just of the judges, because once you centralize it in one in one court, usually that centralizes within a district attorney's office and a prosecution office, and they well, all become experts in it as well. Um, so I, I, there's definitely efficiency there. Um, I would love to see data on outcomes. Um, okay. But I, so I'm a mixed minds about it, but I think it's definitely something to consider and did come up several times. Um, all right. And Mike, I, I think it's something where Brian is still with us. I don't know if you want to. Oh, so no. remember Brian. I, I definitely, I definitely am, and I apologize. I'm balancing oh, no worries. I multiple appreciate time you. commitments, but yeah, I think I appreciate you're you speaking with us. No, I, I think your experience, Mike, with um, with a singular judge adds a lot of uh, important for some of the foundations of Mr. Lowenthal um, and how we kind of think through that resentencing piece, and so. Would love to continue to learn more from your experience as we decide what pathways make the most sense. Um, there's definitely been a lot for us to consider and think about following the discussions today. Uh, and I think it's been just incredibly well done today to the team and to the staff. Yeah, no, and, and I, I don't have a definitive what feeling about this one way or another. And, and honestly, it was one judge in Los Angeles County, which is obviously by far the largest county. And so maybe counties like Los Angeles should have more than one judges, where Tulare County, maybe they can have a dedicated judge. Maybe that makes more sense. So in any event, um, it's something to continue. And I, something that I want to continue with the, with the whole committee. And this is obviously our first meeting of the year, and we'll have many more opportunities to discuss and boil down these ideas a little bit further. Um, and it's, you know, late on a Friday. So, uh, but I, we did get it through a tremendous amount. I think we learned a lot about what laws have worked and which haven't. I wish that I could say that there was one through line that said these kind of laws, you know, are really effective and these kind aren't. As Judge, as Senator Skinner said at the top, is it because it's discretionary and this isn't discretionary? Well, it turns out that discretionary statutes have, we've had success and and less than optimal success. And and um, so I think that we'll continue to distill down that. And this is, you know, not an easy job. If it was an easy job, it would be, it would be done already. So, um, I think that there are some things that we can do to help facilitate um, these processes. And I'm glad to see, I think on average, many of the reforms that we have proposed are working as expected. Um, and I think that we should you know, not, not lose sight of that. So with that said, um, unless either of you have anything that you'd like to add, I think we should move to public comment. All right. Um, so we've now reached the time for public comment. Uh, for those listening via, via Zoom to get in line, please select the raised hand function in Zoom. If you're calling in, you can hit star nine. Note that this meeting is being recorded and if you make a public comment, your name and our phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. We'll take a minute now to see how many people wanna comment and based on that, I will see how long each person has to comment. Please note that the, co that the comment, that the, excuse me, that the committee also accepts and in fact prefers public comment in writing. That comment can be emailed to committee staff who emails, whose email addresses are available on the committee webpage. So Doug, I mean, excuse me, Tom, can you tell us, let's see how many people show up. Looks like we've got about seven people already. Why don't we get started? And All right. Um, if you could keep your comments to 90 seconds, I would appreciate it. I can't see, oh, I can't. I got it. I can, oh, I can manage it, yeah. All First right. up is uh, Crispy, of course. Thank you, Crispy. Good to hear your voice, or good to hear you. Hi, um, Crispy. Um, I'm a survivor of harm. I'm going to be reading comments from my compatriots uh, who are 
incarcerated inside and who have gone through the inside organizer program um, that Greg was talking to, talking about for, with Initiate Justice. So the first one is from Dortel Williams. He's actually a mentor to inside organizers um, and he's serving life without the possibility of parole at Chuckawalla Valley State Prison, which is slated for closure. Sentencing enhancements do not make us safer. Extreme sentences in all forms promote homelessness, which result in more violence, which harm both staff and the incarcerated. Hope motivates change and change comes with consistent and abundant rehabilitation programs that teach alternatives to deviant behavior. From Kenneth Moore Jr., also uh, a senior inside organizer, he's 41 years old, incarcerated at the California Men's Colony, and he's been down for 20 years. I ask that you consider changing the laws regarding gun enhancements. It is excessive, too harsh of a punishment, and part of the tough on crime laws designed to oppress people. I accept accountability for all of my crimes. Many of us have aged out of crime and are transformed enough to be back in society. I appreciate the fact that the committee is considering changing the laws and acknowledge the good work that you are doing. Please make those laws better so we can do be, be better for our fellow citizens. People out outside should not have to pay their hard earned money for excessive sentences that do not deter crime or make people safer. Thank you and I appreciate all the hard work that you guys do. Thank you, Crispy. Um, I think that you'll share my sentiment uh, I thought Judge Lowenthal put it best today at the beginning when he said long sentences age poorly, um, and it's something that we're trying to address. So thank you very much. Ernest Che. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, yes, uh, I would just wanted to make a comment about the uh, sentence enhancements with respect to like prior crimes. Um, now, I, I believe that that would be wouldn't that uh, conflict with the uh, guarantees against double jeopardy? Um, you know, you, you, you're essentially giving somebody an extra year for a prison prior um, for a, basically you're putting them in double jeopardy. Um, and, you know, I do believe that, uh, and I just want to make a comment on that as well. Uh, I can follow up uh, with a more written detailed um, uh, summary but um you know also i you know i, I was recently uh, released from prison and you know everyone that gets released from prison these are 200 dollars gate money and i don't know uh of a what you know i've met quite a few people in there that don't have me you know a place to go uh, when they get out and i don't know what 200 dollars is going to do for somebody uh in this day and age but um you know i just you know that's in the penal code so i just wanted to bring that up and also, you know, having come from uh, being released from prison, um, I was wondering if the committee would, you know, because in a level two prison right now, which is, you know, um, there's a war going on going on in there um, that that you uh, the committee may not be aware of with respect to um, like the good and the no good people. I don't know if you understand uh, what, what I'm saying, but um, maybe you know uh, insight. On what's going on in you know in the prisons may actually help uh, the committee make a couple of decisions. So I mean, I just wanted to throw those uh, ideas out there. So thank you very much. A couple of things. The double jeopardy question is a very tough one. I agree with you. Come to my class at Stanford sometime. We will talk about that. I talk about with that with my mm -hmm. students. It's not that's hard to untie. When we started the committee, we talked about having one of these hearings inside prison walls. That was then COVID has, has, you know, hit and made that impossible. It's a high on our priority list to try to make that happen again. So I hear that loud and clear. Uh, thanks for your call. Um, uh, you know, there are also uh, other laws. I mean, since we're on the, the penal, uh, penal code revision, there are other laws like um, like criminal threats. Uh, there is no, those, those, that's a wobbler right now. And, uh, you know, the law should have more specificity with respect to, what kind of conduct it, it determines a misdemeanor and what kind of conduct determines a felony because that too is left to the prosecutor. And, and that can be a, a situation where you're getting, um, you know, certain prosecutors that are more, uh, you know, that no, are being- I, 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 I totally uh, get that. And that's not the only one where there are wobblers. And, I, and right, we try right. to, you know, build in some both flexibility to address individual circumstances, but also direction to the courts and prosecutors. So I agree about that. Um, but please send in your writing on things that you think we most need addressing and, and we'd be happy to consider that. 
I will. Well, thank. I thank you. Next up is Jane Corrant. Hi there. Um, good to be here. Um, I don't know how to get my picture up. I'd love to just say hello. Uh, I see you. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about Contra Costa County because not only do I um, uh, do I keep keep an eye on uh, keep all three eyes, four eyes on what's going on in the state, but I'm active in a racial justice coalition um, in uh, our county. And I just want to appreciate the emphasis that you all put on data collection with respect to RJA. It has, it took our coalition, I would say seven, eight, maybe nine years to get our county um, to acknowledge a conservative county, as you probably know, with maybe one or two supervisors exceptions, um, to actually um, mandate that there be a racial justice task force. And um, the Burns Institute um, has been facilitating it, and now it is an oversight. Um, and the fight to get the statistics out of the sheriff's office, um, I, I, he I heard what was going on in other counties. It horrifies me. It saddens me. And um, it was a real community effort. And I, I also want to just appreciate Evan Kulik. Um, it is, it is a, such a marvelous public defender office. Um, countless people in there fighting really hard. Um, I heed uh, Mr. Kulik made, made mention of the desperate need for RJA to be applied to LWAP sentences. And I heard all of the ob obstacles and how difficult it is to get any case at all. Um, and these are, are huge cases. Um, but, you know, the, the racial disparities, as you are well aware, and I think in your uh, last year's recommendation that we get rid of um, life without parole sentencing, which I applaud, um, as well as the death penalty, that you know the racial disparities are great. Yeah. So I, I hope that you will continue as a committee because we sent in um, articles inside because I too um, are involved with IJ and, and getting in touch with people inside through them and other coalitions. Um, and there was a, just a great deal of hope um, when well, they heard that the Penal Code Revision Commission had actually endorsed the abolition of that sentence. I, so, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm sorry to cut you off. We're just trying to. I understand. I understand. Possible. I have and, friends probably waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank, and, you. Thank, thank you for being a loyal listener and commenter. And it really does make a difference. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yolanda N. Hello. Um, I'm, I, this is Yolanda Navaretti, and I am also going to read a comment um, from an inside organizer. Go ahead. Good, after, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is um, Jasper Stalling, Senior Inside Organizer with Initiate Justice. I'm currently serving 127 years to life at Valley State Prison. 20 plus years of my sentence is from enhancements. The same enhancement was added to almost every charge. I believe that the court has abused the policies and statutes that are imposed in court proceedings, claiming that it's under the color of the law, while it really is a way to over-sentence minorities who cannot typically afford a paid attorney. A way to keep people of color down for an extended period of time, cutting off all of our hope. I would like to say thank you to the panel, ladies and gentlemen, and I ask that you I ask that you all today look into your hearts and ask yourself, what does it take to ensure that they, we all will have a chance to rehabilitate ourselves? And how can we come home better people and allow them to give them back to society and in their communities? That way we are not just here being a number in the system. Enhancements takes away our and many chances to help our people and our communities. Thank you. And I also wanna personally say on my behalf, um, where Judge Matzman was saying that um, the judges are going to change the charge. No, I want to stipulate that we, the judges are not going to change the charge. They're just going to change a sentence. So, um, and I really look forward to the second look back because my husband has served 29 years on an LWAP sentence, costing the state over $2.9 million. Thank you. 
Thank you, Yolanda. It's good to hear your voice. Marion Wickard. Good afternoon. Hey, afternoon. it's my opinion. The Penal Code Revision Committee has made a deep impact and is part of the reason why Governor Newsom announced the rehabilitation program at San Quentin this morning. And I'd like to thank you all for your continued support. Thank you. Tommy has been down for 21 years without any disciplinary actions. Tommy's 57 years determinate sentence, base sentence 11 years, 46 years of enhancements has kept Tommy from going to board. When others with greater crimes, life sentences are not only going to board, but have been given release dates or have been released. Long-term determinate sentences need to be addressed. With Tommy's age and his long-term determinate sentence, he is the closest one could be to an LWAP without being an LWAP. SB 1393, Nickel Prior Prison Terms, is subject to the judge's discretion at the time of the original sentencing. Anyone being sentenced prior to SB 1393, the Nickel Prior Prison Term en Enhancement is not allowed back in court and it is not retroactive. I know you've discussed that, but I still need to talk about it. The retroactivity should also be for those who took responsibility for their crimes and accepted deals. Sentences have not, sentences have been reduced by far since the 90s and the early 2000s. Therefore, Tommy does not have the opportunity to have his nickel prior enhancements removed due to the time period he was sentenced. Tommy was sentenced to two years, his first crime. However, after all the enhancements he's received, he is serving over 15 years for the first crime he ever committed. We don't give children a timeout and add on to their next timeout due to their previous actions, why do we sentence people over and over for a past crime through enhancements? I'd like to thank all of you for your time and I truly appreciate your committee. Thank you. And we appreciate your support and continued participation in these hearings. Thanks. Next up is G. Hey, uh, thanks guys. Thank you all so much for all you do. Amazing panels today. I'm gonna say two things. One is um, I'd love a comment back. Um, the first thing though I just wanted to say is um, a simple statement. And that is that I really hope and pray um, that if and when folks are transferred from death row that as uh, the governor said that everyone is absolutely individually considered. Um, and I really, really, really hope that there is a possibility that people can choose to stay at the California dash um, Scandinavian modeled prison at San Quentin. Um, my question is this, and we've talked about it before, and I so appreciate you all, but um, when might you have a panel on solitary confinement and I'm hoping that perhaps the committee will think about supporting AB 280, the Mandela Act, um, and or just at least feature a panel. I know we've it's you know it's emulating the halt solitary and and Mike. I know you discussed that that model in New York. So um, yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Um, we have generally stayed away from prison condition issues, but I don't think it's beyond our jurisdiction. And I think that that particular piece of legislation is particularly important. And if we can be helpful um, in providing our insight and study on that, uh, I think it's something that we should very much consider. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Next up is Raina Selnick. Hello. Um, I Can you hear me? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, Thank you for focusing on RJA today. Um, obviously, the data is essential. I just wanted to share my experience with collecting data, in the, um, which has been the DA's office have the charging data. I haven't been running into issues with that, but my uh, coming to a lot of dead ends with the disposition data. Um, I think this is beyond your scope, but I am concerned that there hasn't been funding put in put aside for um, to support public defenders and um, their work with RJA. Um, and I'm worried that this could um, prove to be a larger barrier to RJA and what it can be. Um, and beyond making the data available to public defenders offices, I'm asking that um, also people who are inside and their loved ones need access to it um, so they could be looking at retroactive um, claims. 
And then I just want to, I, yeah. And I just wanted to say, I don't know if assembly member Brian's here, but it's, I haven't been here for a few months and it's really great to see him here. And thank you. That's it. Next up is John Lindsay Polo. Ooh, I just want to say that we're, oh. I like to just say little things. Uh, yeah. We're glad to obviously have assembly member Brian as part of this committee uh, as well. RJA was a, is, is a super righteous and super ambitious piece of legislation, which I think today we've learned is has a lot of hard time um, actually being implemented. And um, I think it's one of our goals is to try to make sure that it's implemented as it was intended. There's a lot more work to be done there, clearly. All right, John Lindsay Poland. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I work for the American Friends Service Committee, which uh, has been a co-sponsor of RJA and RJA for All. Um, there is a, a new RJA 3.0 that is uh, AB 1118, which tries to do some technical fixes. <clears throat> I don't think we'll really address <clears throat> the data issues that have been raised, um, but I do want to say something about the both the importance and difficulty around data. That is, um, in Alameda County, where where I am, uh, we're seeking data um, also because of uh, jail issues, not just um, state prison issues, uh, and that this this impacts the the lack of data impacts not only the racial disparities, but also impacts the ways in which people with mental illness or substance use disorders are um, disproportionately. Uh, jailed, um, uh, pre-sentencing, many of them, you know, 90% of people in our county jail are pre-sentenced. And um, that, so the unlocking that flow of data is not only important for addressing the racial disparities as RJA is, is intended to do, but also uh, to address the ways in which people with mental illness are being uh, incarcerated in ways that are not only disproportionate, but are you know, of course, against healing. And um, the, the HIPAA concerns around trying to understand how the charging data and the disposition data intersects with uh, clinical data is very important and very difficult to get at under the current system. So to the extent that any of that um, unlocking of the data uh, through DAs or through sheriff's office can also impact um, those issues around incarceration of people with mental illness, as well as the racial disparities, it would be a, a big advance. Yeah, it was something that we didn't come up too much today, which I think is critically important that we talk about a lot is folks with mental health issues and the problems, the separate problems, the independent problems posed by people in jail as opposed to CDCR. Obviously, I mean, uh, we focus a lot on CDCR for good reasons and for bads. I think that in a upcoming, uh, hearing, we're going to focus on the sh shorter term sentences and sentences to county jail because I think that there pros a lot of unique and special problems. So thank you for lifting that up. Thanks. And pre-sentencing. Yes. But everybody who's not in CDCR, but still in the justice system. Carol Harbottle. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, my issue, I'm a, I'm a defense attorney, and I do some of the appeals of the Superior Court. It's on uh, 1437. They amended it and added 775, one of my cases were the ones that was under review that added attempt murder. Attempt murder, when they did that, they added only under the natural and probable consequences. Well, in the Central Valley, they're not using the jury instructions that would apply to natural and probable. They're using uh, um, the jury instruction 400, which says they're equally guilty to impute malice. I'd like to see the uh, it be uniform where they're not different sentences. If it's if he it was a murder, they would be entitled to relief because they weren't the actual killer. But since it's attempt murder, they're not entitled to relief. Mm. And so I would like to have that. I had a couple of my cases re rejected because of it. They didn't use, and that's just a loophole that they're going to keep them incarcerated. It's similarly situated to a murder conviction, but they didn't use one jury instruction that kept them out of being get it, granting relief. So I'd like to see 775-1437 amended. 
I, I hear you. That's a that's a very technical suggestion for public comment. Thank you, though, because it, it really does point to a loophole that I don't think is intended. It would be helpful if you could spell out exactly the, the paragraph sections and how you would amend them in such a way that it would resolve that problem. And it's something that perhaps if you could send it to staff, we could we could look at. So I appreciate that. Yes, I will send a letter with that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that that's it for public comment. That's it. Wow. All right. This has been the end of another long and I think really productive and helpful uh, hearing. Thank you to my fellow committee members. Thank you especially to staff who gathered all our witnesses, prepared the memos, really got us up to speed. Thank you to all our witnesses. And um, I wish everybody a happy weekend. This is the beginning of our uh, hearing schedule for the year. We'll have several others and we'll continue to address these issues. Um, in the months to come. If you have comments, please send them in because we're gonna continue chewing these over until uh, really December, November, December. So thank you all again, have a good weekend and um, I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Mr. Chair.